Hello world, I'm Anna Patel and today I'm going to be talking about reactive microservice architecture. I will be going over the typical way people convert monoliths to microservices and how we can improve that with a more event-driven system. I will go over the wins and woes of this type of system and we will end with a demo. A bit about myself, I am a lead engineer at Runnable and after getting my masters from Georgia Tech, I started my career writing kernel drivers at NVIDIA and then I made the switch to distributed systems. Believe it or not, they actually have the same problems, mostly programmers. And for the past four years, I have helped design and build reactive systems here at Runnable that are currently handling over two million messages a day. Now outside of programming, I love music and I'm a DJ for fun. Before we get started, I need to show this warning. This talk contains grossly oversimplified code and is not intended for use in production. Now that that is out of the way, let's get started with an example. As a DJ, I love finding and sharing music. However, the only people I can share it with are the people around me, typically my friends and family, when I can force them to listen. But now, I want to share it with the world and find people who will actually enjoy it. I want to create a website where people can enjoy music and have a discussion. I call it thebestmusic.com. On this site, you can listen to music and comment it on it. Lucky for me, I have all you smart people here to help me build it. Let's get started. We build this application out in the traditional monolith fashion. Everything is in one big service. The music player, video hosting, database, comments, all in one big application. Let's take a look at some code that handles when a user comments. When a user comments, what we do is we normalize the text, save the comment in the database, and send a thank you email. Pretty straightforward. We deployed this as is, and it works. Although it does use 11 gigabytes of memory to run, but who cares, it's running. Now this worked for a very long time. That is, until the rough remix came out by the DOGG, and we went viral. We started getting massive amounts of traffic, so we had to start scaling the system out. And it's pretty expensive, because remember, each instance takes 11 gigabytes of memory just to run. And that's pretty expensive. With all these new users also came a lot more feature requests. I want to add stickers to my comments. Where's the markdown support? I forgot my password and I need to reset it. And because of the current architecture, adding new features became increasingly more risky. That was because if any code crashed in any of these new features, the entire system went down. But we couldn't slow down and test things more thoroughly or hire an army of QA testers since our competitor, OverPlayedMusic.com, was pumping out new features all the time and we just can't let them win. We heard about microservices and thought it would solve all our problems. So we went to our monolith and broke it down into functional parts so we can scale and deploy them separately. The parser, the mailer, and the database connector all became separate microservices. As for the stuff that couldn't be broken out for whatever reason, we kept in our legacy service, aka the microlib. Now this service was also responsible for coordinating everything. That's why it's so large. Let's take a look at how the code would look in this type of system. Instead of making calls directly, we now have HTTP clients for them. The code still looks pretty similar, but we've actually introduced some hidden problems. Let's say the email service was down. Then this call would fail. The comment might be saved, and the user would get some error on the front end. In this kind of architecture, when something goes down, all of its dependents typically fail with it. What about another problem? What if the emailer was overloaded and just became slow? The user would see a spinner and get frustrated at the fact that they couldn't be the first one to post a comment. Now, in this kind of architecture, the speed of the request can't be faster than your slowest service. And in today's world where people want instant gratification, this is just not acceptable. But I'm sure everyone listening writes perfect code, has 100% test coverage, catches and handles all errors, and sets a sane timeout for every request. But what about this situation? If we want something to happen, something different to happen when a user comments. Very few people still read emails. We want to do something fresh and new. Along with the email, we also want to send a thank you selfie on Snapchat. Now since no one here knows how that works, we hire an outside dev to do the work. 
And with microservices, this should be easy. All they have to do is create a new service and add one line of code in our legacy application. Easy, right? Microservices for the win. But it turns out our Snapchat developer lives the YOLO lifestyle and tests changes directly on production. A bit of a prod cowboy. Now, the single line change deployed to production actually breaks our core functionality. No one can comment anymore. One of the promises that microservices made was we would get resilient, fault tolerant systems. And without tremendous investment, we actually don't get to see those benefits. We got to this type of system thinking in a linear way. When X happens, do A, B, and C. But if we think about systems in a different way, we might be able to make a system robust enough that even Netflix would be proud of it. Enter reactive architecture. Instead of having one coordinator service, which tells the other services what to do, we need to make our services smarter and know what to do when they need to do it. What do I mean by that? In our example, the legacy service should not be telling the emailer to send an email or the database to save the comments. Instead, the emailer should know when a user has commented and send the email accordingly. Similarly, the database should know when a comment was posted and persist that data. Now, what would an architecture like this look like? Well, something like this. You can see that our legacy app has shrunk considerably now that it is not responsible for telling others what to do. But the main difference is we now have a message bus that connects everything. The message bus is in charge of routing messages to the correct services. It knows who is subscribed to what events and routes the messages correctly. It is the heart of the system. Two examples of message buses are Kafka and RabbitMQ. We actually use RabbitMQ here at Runnable. Now let's take a look at how the code would change. Now, when a user comments, the legacy app simply emits an event to the system, comment received, and all the services that care about this event listen for it and react. The emailer would receive this event and would send a thank you email. At the same time, the parser would also receive this event from the message bus. It will normalize the text, and it will also emit an event, comment normalized, which the database picks up and persists the data. Now take note of the event names. They do not say parser parse or database save. They only tell what has happened. Now this is important because this means none of the services know that the other exists. It just knows about its own world. It listens to what it wants to listen to and it emits what it wants to emit. It has no clue what happens when it emits its event. Now what about our Snapchat feature? All that is needed now is a separate service which interfaces with Snapchat and simply listens for the event, comment received. No other changes are needed in the system. In fact, the Snapchat developer does not need to know anything about the existing system, only that it needs to listen to a comment received event. And this service can go down as many times as it likes, and it will not affect the rest of the system because it is not in the critical flow anymore. Now let's talk about what makes this architecture really great. You already saw how none of the services know about each other, and that makes them 100% truly decoupled. And like with the Snapchat feature, a new service can come in without affecting the rest of the stack, and this lowers the risk of new changes. It can crash as many times as it wants. Hopefully, not forever though. And since any service can crash without affecting the system, it can degrade gracefully. Now when the service comes back up, they can be sent any messages that it missed, so the whole system can self-heal itself. And I'm sure you've noticed that the service now are just event emitters and consumers. All that is needed is an event spec, and anyone can build this service. The developer no longer needs to know about the rest of the system. They just work on their little black box, and this promotes independent teams. Now with all architectures, there are some trade-offs it's time to talk about the woes. First things first, the message bus now becomes a single point of failure. If this goes down, the entire system goes down. Now we want to make sure that this service is highly available and we want to follow all best practices for this bus. We also want to make sure we persist these messages in case of catastrophic failure. Another major concern is now with all these messages flying around, it becomes extremely difficult to figure out cross-service flows or just 
the critical path in general. Since the sequence of events is not in code anymore, we need to make sure we have good transaction logging and great documentation of the events. Typically in the logs, you want the publisher of the event, the consumer of the event, and a transaction ID. Consistency is also a big problem in this kind of system. Since we're dealing with async messages, we can never guarantee at what point in time they will complete. However, we can guarantee eventual consistency by ensuring two things. The first, all event consumers should be item potent. And the second, the message bus should guarantee at least once delivery. If these two conditions are met, then the system will be eventually consistent. Now it's cool to theorize about these architectures, but it's another thing to actually use them. This is actually how Runnable's architecture is built. The container world is moving very quickly, and we need to keep up with it. With our old stack, we suffered from a lot of regressions and major outages because we had to ship features too quickly. Moving to this event-driven stack has helped us push out new features with little risk. Since we removed this master service in charge of everything, our code actually became less complicated, and there was simply less of it to maintain. We also rely on a lot of third-party services, and these services each have their own SLAs. Because this type of architecture is self-healing and asynchronous, we don't just go down because one of our dependencies is having a bad day. Also, an unexpected benefit that came out of this was it's actually great for new hires. Instead of having them fix bugs, read outdated docs, or writing boring tests, they can actually make a small service and push it to production, and we won't have to worry about them bringing down the site. And that is really powerful. Now enough with the talking, let's get to the demo. If you head on over to reactive.runnable.com, you will see our app, thebestmusic.com. All this code is actually hosted here on GitHub, forward slash runnable, forward slash reactive-demo. And the clients are here, and I'll get to those later. Now, this is our simple application. If we leave a comment, we will show up here. Now, this is the app that I showed in my talk. If we go to the server hosting this, you'll see we have the front end, we have a parser, we have the database, the emailer, Redis is what the database connects to, and our message bus, RabbitMQ. Now, what the, what the front end does is it sends these messages over WebSocket to the parser, which then just normalizes the text and sends that to the database. The database then persists that data into Redis. And at the same time, just like the demo, the emailer sends an email out. And all this magic happens on top of RabbitMQ. Now, let's do some cool stuff. Let's kill the emailer. Now, since this is a reactive system and there's no dependencies, this should still work. And as you can see, the rest of the system still functions even though there is no longer any emailer. What if we kill the parser now, which is part of the critical path? the parser. As you can see, the front end doesn't update, but RadRoomQ is holding this message in the queue. So if we start this back up, the WebSocket event goes through and we actually see this. Now what about the database connector? IQDDB connector. Yep, same thing happens. It's stuck. So now the message has actually been parsed and it's just being held in the reactive demo database queue. So if we start this up again, you'll see the message gets replayed and it works as well. Now let's, let's be adventurous and kill the actual database. Let's kill Redis. I killed Redis. And like before, we don't see anything. Oh no. Now let's start this. Oops. We actually don't see anything. How about after a page refresh? 
oh, our data went missing. It turns out Redis is an in-memory database. However, as soon as Redis came up, the database connector actually held those messages until the database came up, and it actually still populated these messages. Now let's look at a local example. So you can follow this example. You can actually connect to this today. All you have to do is run this simple Docker command. And I have it already. I also have added the environment variable app name so that all the messages we missed, we can actually get back. So as you can see, we just received every message that was held in the queue because we connected with the same app name. Now if I pick a different app name, which will be a new service, I can receive all the new comments. And as you can see, these comments are right here. If we stop the service and continue to comment, four, five, six, seven, eight. If we reconnect with the same app name, we're going to receive these messages that we just sent. And this way, the app can self recover. All the code is available here. Just go to reactive.runnable.com and you can see all the code here and play around with it. If you have any questions, feel free to tweet me at aka DJ Phase or send me an email at anand at runnable.com. Hope you enjoyed this talk. See you later.